Uh, when award-winning British journalist Yvonne Redley was, uh, was, was captured by the Taliban in 2001, last thing she expected was to convert to Islam a few years later in the summer of 2003. After promising to read the Quran following her release, Ridley fulfilled her word and found that the Quran was in fact a magna carta for women. Ridley now actively works to further such Islamic principles as peace and hospitality through numerous means. Using her journalism, she has written two books, one of which will be on sale tonight, inshallah, for 10 bucks close to the gift of paradise. Okay? Yes. So without further ado, this should go on. I bet each and every one of you in here tonight can remember exactly where you were, who you were with, what you were doing that day. I was in my newsroom in London where I worked for a right-wing tabloid newspaper called the Sunday Express. And I noticed a lot of colleagues gathering around one of the many TV sets in the newsroom and I shouted over what's going on. And somebody said, there's been a terrible accident. A plane has gone into one of the skyscrapers in New York. And there's something compelling, isn't there, about f a breaking news unfolding before your very eyes. So very soon I got up and joined my colleagues and we were speculating, had the pilot had a heart attack, you know, what had happened that this terrible accident had happened and just then a second plane came into sight and smashed into I think it was the North Tower and as soon as that happened I think we all realized that this was a terrorist strike. Now I know from speaking to Muslims around the world the very first reaction from the Muslim community was to pick up the phone and call loved ones. Where are you? This has happened. Come home. Keep your head down. Look out. There'll be a backlash. Muslims are bound to get the blame. And so the first concerns of, um, of my many Muslim friends uh, was for their immediate family. For me, I just looked and thought, this is one big, big story. And as the drama continued to unfold, I thought it's bigger than the assassination of JFK. It almost rivals man landing on the moon. I've got to get to New York. And so I set about uh, getting some clothes, a bag, and headed off for Heathrow Airport. By the time I got to Heathrow, both towers had um, imploded. The Pentagon had been hit. Another plane had gone down in a field and America's airspace had been closed down. So I tried to work out a way of maybe flying to South America and getting a car and driving up through Mexico, or maybe flying to Canada and driving down. We were working out which way we could get into America, but the borders were then sealed and America was under siege. She was at war with an unknown enemy. For the next few days, I spent in and out of the airport trying to get tickets for that first flight out to uh, New York, and um, I succeeded, and as I made my way to the departure lounge, my mobile phone went, and it was my boss. He said, there's been a change of plan. We need you to go to Pakistan. And I said, Pakistan? Uh, you know, all my clothes are for downtown New York. I'll probably need injections. Is it safe to go there? I've never been there in my life. You know, what do I want to go there for? But 12 hours later, I arrived in Islamabad airport, and of course, he was right. Within two days, 3,000 other journalists had descended on Pakistan. It was quite a boom time for the hoteliers because $30 a week, uh, rooms were going for $250 a night and um, as uh, the media just piled in and, uh, and waited as the war of words escalated between Downing Street, Washington, Islamabad um, directed at the Taliban. 
I decided that um, the best story for me, because I work for a Sunday newspaper, so I don't like to react to the news. I try and, and think of what is going to be news four or five days down the line. I decided that the best story had to be not from the politicians, but from ordinary Afghan people to get their hopes and fears, to find out what life was like living under the Taliban. And so I went off to the Taliban embassy in Islamabad and filled out a form three times over three days and three times each time I was rejected. Later that week, Mullah Omar, the Taliban spiritual leader, had kicked out all of the Western journalists, which was a really crazy thing to do. I know that most people don't like journalists, but we are a necessary evil. We are the eyes and ears. We need to be in places where people in power are going to do terrible things, because if we're not there, we can't report them. And so it was a very short-sighted thing for the Taliban to do to kick out the Western media. It was looking fairly hopeless, and I was sitting with my Pakistan guide who was ever resourceful, and we were trying to work out a way of how I could get into Afghanistan. Just then, the BBC's chief correspondent, John Simpson, was uh, talking about the burqa, and he said, you become invisible if you put on the burqa. I put it on and went into the tribal areas and nobody took any notice. And I just thought, well, if the BBC's gargantuan correspondent, he's a great big man, can disappear under a burqa, then surely I can. And so with my guide, Pasha, we set about um, plotting uh, a way to get into Afghanistan. We got two of his friends, one from the Northwest Frontier Province and um, another who was born in Afghanistan. They were linked through marriage. And the three of us uh, set off to go into Afghanistan. We went and drove through the Khyber Pass, which is more than 30 miles of the most dramatic scenery that you can imagine. Really beautiful, narrow, winding mountain roads. At points, it was about five or six feet, feet um, wide. It was very narrow in some places. And we descended down into this dust bowl called Torkham. And when we got to Torkham, we parked the car and got out and began to walk across no man's land into Afghanistan. As we walked across, I saw these really scary looking men with big turbans and Kalashnikovs. And I was beginning to think, you know, Yvonne, maybe this isn't such a good idea after all. And I wanted to turn around and run. But I got beyond the point of no return. And so we walked through and it was as though I was wearing Harry Potter's invisible cloak. I just walked straight through. I think I was across on somebody's travel documents. The Taliban didn't even give me a first glance, never mind a second glance. And we jumped into a taxi and drove to the nearest city, which was uh, Jalalabad. When we got into the marketplace, I was really excited because, you know, as I'm looking through the grill of my burqa, I thought I'm going to see, get a, a little snapshot of life under the Taliban. George Bush and Tony Blair had told us this was the most brutal, evil regime in the world, and they hated women. And since George Bush and Tony Blair were saying that, well, it must be true. And so as I walked into the marketplace, imagine my surprise when I saw that all the shopping was being done by the men. And I thought, wow, this is liberating. But of course, under the Taliban, women were not allowed to talk to men other than close male relatives, a husband, a brother, a father. So unless you were related to a trader, it was impossible to buy a bag of flour or sugar. So that's why the men were doing all the shopping. I still think it's a great idea, just needs finely tuning in places. The guides got their provisions and we set off to this tiny little village called Karma, probably half the size of um, a soccer pitch. And 
when we got there, we were armed with lots of food. You know, this is after two decades of war, drought and famine. So the sight of um, a relative returning to the fold armed with goodies was uh, very welcome. And it was a very joyous occasion. And there was much celebration until they found out that there was a Western journalist in the company. The woman in the burqa was a Western journalist. They were furious only that day. Mullah Omar had said, anyone helping a, Western, um, helping a Westerner in this time of war would be executed as a spy. So you can imagine how they felt when they discovered who I was. But there's something wonderful about the Afghan people. Their hospitality is only matched by their curiosity. <clears throat> and within half an hour, um, the ice was broken. I was handed a, a corn on the cob to, uh, to eat and uh, a young girl started talking to me and using the, one of the guides as a translator, I asked her a little bit about herself and about her hopes and fears and she said, I am so frustrated. I am rotting away in this village. I should be qualified as a doctor. I should be in a hospital now with a stethoscope around my neck, ready to help my people in this time of war. And I said, well, what's gone wrong? And she said, the medical school that I was at closed down and I was sent home. And I said, yes, I heard that the Taliban didn't like women to be educated. And her elder brother said, this isn't true. I was also training at the same medical school and I should also be qualified as a doctor. But I was also sent home because the school had no money and the instructors were sent home and then the students, we were all sent home. So I could tell that they were both very frustrated and, and as we continued our conversation, this larger than life lady walked in and she looked me up and down very slowly. And then she put her hands on her hips and her toes started tapping. An international language meaning that there's trouble on the horizon. And she said to me, do you have any children? And this was again through the translator. Everything was through the translator. And eager to get on the good side of this woman, I smiled at her and I said, yes, I do. I have a daughter. And she said, one. And I said, yes, I have one daughter. And she said, you English and American women, you are all so pathetic. All you can ever manage is one or maybe two. Me, I can have 15. And when you run out of your boy soldiers, I will be producing more. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, what happened to this image that we were told about these shy, retiring creatures hiding under the burqa? Um, she certainly wasn't one of them. And I said, but aren't you afraid of the Americans coming in? She said, dare one American soldier come into this village and I myself will fight him off with those pots and pans over there. <laughs> and I thought she probably would. And if the women are this fierce, what are the men like? As the day wore on, it became obvious that um, although people had been happy to um, accommodate me for a couple of hours, that was enough. And I think that they were keen that um, I then go. And so off we set back towards Torquem. But when we got there, the gates had been closed and we were told that uh, General Musharraf wasn't letting anyone um, into Afghan, into Pakistan. So we stayed overnight and then the next day we went back thinking, well, maybe the gates have opened and they were still locked and we were told that they're not going to open for the unforeseeable future. I was beginning to panic because I knew if I didn't get back to a telephone later on that afternoon to call into work to say I was back and safe and sound that the alarm bells would be raised. And so one of my guides said, well, we can go through one of the smuggling routes. And I thought, well, this sounds exciting. You know, we'll be ducking and diving from tree to tree and, and um, <laughs> it'll add to my story and it'll add to the excitement and, um, and won't people be impressed? And I said, oh, yes, let's go. 
through the smuggling route. And we got to this area two hours later and far from it being deserted, it was a hive of activity. There were camel traders, donkey <coughs> traders, people selling refreshments, um, all sorts of goods. There were scores of Afghan families with all their worldly possessions packed into handcarts, heading towards the Pakistan border. There were young men coming over from Pakistan looking for the Taliban. They wanted to sign up and fight the great Satan, as they referred to America. Just loads of coming and, and goings. And by this time, I was feeling quite tired. My feet were cut and blistered from the Afghan shoes I'd been wearing. And I was complaining. And one of my guides said, look, we can make the final part of the journey on the back of a donkey if you want. We're only 10 minutes from the Pakistan border. And he took me to this string of motley animals, these donkeys, and he said, can you ride a donkey? <laughs> I said, can I ride a donkey? I can ride horses, I can jump, I can gallop. Look at these, they're half the size. Of course I can ride a donkey. And so he did a deal with the trader and I got on the back of this animal. Before I had a chance to get hold of the reins, I don't know if it sensed that I was an infidel, but it just shot off like that <laughs> through, heading towards these people who started running in all directions as this out-of-control donkey went berserk. I'm screaming, my arms are flapping, the wind is catching the folds of my burk and making this cracking, snapping sound. The animal's running even faster. And I'm leaning over to try and get hold of the reins. And as I try to get hold of the reins, the one piece of equipment that I had taken into Afghanistan, a camera banned under the Taliban, fell out of the folds of my burqa right into the passing view of a Taliban soldier. In truth, I don't know what happened in the next minute or so. I don't know if the donkey just stopped and threw me off or if he stopped the donkey and pulled me off. Either way, I just smacked into the ground. And as I picked myself up and drew myself to my full height, I looked through the grill of my burqa straight into the eyes of this Taliban soldier. When I got back to London, my friend said, what was going through your mind when you realized that you'd been captured by this evil, brutal regime? And I said, well, for a nanosecond, and it was just a nanosecond, I'm looking straight into the eyes of this soldier, and I thought, my goodness, you are gorgeous. <laughs> he had the most amazing green eyes, those trademark green eyes made famous by the Afghan woman on the front page of the National Geographic magazine. He had magnificent high cheekbones, a wild mane of hair, and a beard with a life of its own. But as I say, <laughs> as I say, it was just for a nanosecond, and then the cold reality of having been captured by the most evil, brutal regime in the world hit me. And he was shouting at me, and he obviously wanted the camera, so I took the camera off and I gave it to him and then I closed my eyes and waited to be shot. After 10 seconds, which is a long time when you're waiting to be shot, I opened my <laughs> eyes again and he'd gone. He'd gone to see the donkey trader. He wanted to know who is in charge of that woman and then he would find out who was responsible for the camera. And I thought, great, I can get away. I had discussed with my two guides, if things go wrong, what should we do? We all agreed that um, it would be every man, or in my case, woman for him herself. Uh, we wouldn't know each other. And so I thought, well, they'll fully understand that I'm going to do a runner. And um, I attached myself onto the back of this uh, crowd. I'm still, you know, in my invisible garment and he doesn't know I'm a Westerner, so I'm going to get away and make good my escape. The border, 10 minutes away. So I set off, and as I did, I looked behind, 
and there the soldier had confronted one of my guides and waved the camera in his face and smacked him across the face. The other guide went to try and cool the situation down. I continued on and then I looked back again and by this time a crowd of angry men had gathered around the two guides and the soldier was in the middle waving the camera angrily at them and I realized at that point I can't leave them behind. So I went back and I tried to push my way through this crowd of men and I was thrown back. This was man's business. It had nothing to do with a woman. And I realized the only way I could attract anyone's attention would be by pulling off my burqa. So I pulled off the burqa and I said in a very loud voice, will somebody let me through? And suddenly you could have heard a pin drop. And it was like the parting of the sea as I walked through these men who thought, where the hell has this come from? What is it, you know, this Western woman? And I walked up towards the soldier who, far from looking ham handsome by this time, was looking rather gormless with his mouth wide open, thinking, what is this? And I quickly looked over at my two guides, thinking that they would be so impressed by my courageous, noble gesture and they looked back at me as if to say, we were in trouble with the camera. Now we're in serious trouble. So even that wasn't appreciated. And we were all bundled into a vehicle and driven off at high speed back towards Jalalabad. On the journey, something was bothering the driver and the soldier. And they kept turning around, looking at me arguing angrily with each other and in the end the car stopped and the soldier got out and he opened the uh, passenger door and he motioned for me to get out which I happily did you know he was a man with a gun why wouldn't I do as I'm told and he directed me to this uh, raised piece of ground and I stood on it and then he went off over this hill and I'm standing there on this raised piece of ground wondering what's happening, what's going on and I'm looking around, the place was deserted, barren and then I'm looking at the ground and there's some rocks and some stones and some pebbles. Oh my goodness, it's the stoning corner. He's gone to get a crowd and I'm going to be stoned to death. He's over there now, over that hill, probably saying, come on, quick, we've got a Westerner stoning in 10 minutes. And I'm looking round. Really, I, I thought, you know, I had bought into all of this propaganda about how brutal and evil these people were. And I'm looking down, my shoes and socks had gone somewhere in the melee of being bundled into the car. And... Uh, and all I could see staring back up at me was blood red nail varnish. Nail varnish was banned under the Taliban and I thought if they see the colour of my nails, they'll probably start by chopping my toes off one by one first. So I'm standing there thinking all of these terrible thoughts. Now I don't know how many of you have been to Afghanistan, no need to put your hands up, but... For those of you who haven't been, it's an amazing place. You can have a completely deserted landscape one minute, two minutes later, there's a crowd. Where they come from, how they get there, because there's nobody on the horizon, <laughs> suddenly there's a crowd. And there was about up to 100 angry-looking men with great big beards, some with turbans, just standing there in a semicircle, staring at me, standing on this raised piece of ground they started to get closer and closer and of course I'm thinking they're getting closer and closer because they want to take good aim when the stoning starts they want a front row position of course in their culture they wouldn't normally see a woman unveiled unless it was a wife a sister a daughter and, and uh, so I guess they were coming closer and closer to have a look at this unusual spectacle of a Westerner standing on a raised piece of ground 
wearing nothing more than a shalwa kameez and no veil or no headscarf. So I guess it would be like looking at a panda in the zoo for the first time. So they're coming closer and closer. I think they're coming closer, so they're going to kill me. And I'm staring at them, trying to find a kind face, somebody who will be my hero, somebody who will say, stop the stoning. But they all looked really angry as they're getting closer and closer. And I just thought, that's it. I'm just going to start praying. I'll throw myself on my knees and start praying. And then I thought, no, I can't do that. These are Muslims. And as soon as I start praying like a Christian, they'll start the stoning early. <laughs> then... It's amazing the thought processes you go through when you think you're, you're about to die. Then I remembered as a Sunday school teacher many years telling some children about how Jesus stopped a stoning. He went to the crowd and he said, let him without sin cast the first stone. And I thought, right, I'm going to say that to these <laughs> lot. Obviously, the fact that they couldn't speak English wasn't entering my head at the time. I was uh, in a desperate panic trying to think, how can I stop this stoning? So I'm looking round, taking a deep breath, ready to say, let him without sin cast the first stone. And I'm looking, and then I caught sight of three old men at the back with big, long, white beards, and I thought, no, I'm not going to say it because they'll say, that's us, and they'll start the stoning early. <laughs> We're laughing now, but I really thought that I was minutes away from the most horrendous death. I really thought this little area was where I was going to die, and I'm just praying to God that the first stone that hits me knocks me out, so I'm not going to feel any pain. All of this is going on through my mind and suddenly my thought processes were interrupted by the return of the Taliban soldier. He came back over the hill, not with a crowd, but with a woman wearing a burqa. She came up behind me and pushed me round so I had my back to the crowd and she started to frisk me. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to die. Well, not immediately anyway. They want to check and see if I'm carrying any weapons. So all the fear that I had felt began to slide away and I was just totally relieved. But then that relief turned to anger. Those men behind me had made me feel as though I was seconds away from death. So I pulled away from the Afghan woman and swung back round at the men. Bearing in mind I'm standing there in my shalwa kameez, the long trousers and dress. And I said, I am not carrying any weapons and then picked the hem of my dress up and went, look! <laughs> exactly, exactly, wow. Well, they didn't say wow. What they did... <laughs> what, they, what they did collectively, collectively they just went <gasps> like that. And they all turned round and started running as though the devil was snapping at their heels. Of course, this was highly inappropriate behaviour from a woman in Afghanistan. And the lady in the burqa swung me back round and whacked me across the face to show how much she disapproved of this vulgar gesture. And then I was bundled back into the car and driven off at speed. Afghanistan was then and, and very much is today broken and fractured. Communications were poor, nobody had a telephone, but there is an amazing um, networking going on there. How it goes on, I have no idea, but news swept the area that an American spy had been captured. So at every checkpoint that our car stopped at, people came running over to have a look at the American spy. At one checkpoint, I wound the window down and I said, don't worry, I'm not American, I'm English, and nodding for approval, and they just looked back as if to say, what difference does that make? <laughs> at another checkpoint, this little boy, maybe nine or 10, came running up to the window, squashed his face right into the window to get a good look at the American spy, 
And I looked at him and I smiled and I winked at him and he drew his face back in <laughs> disapproval and shook his head gravely and then went like that. <laughs> As we headed um, towards Jalalabad, we soon had a convoy of, um, of Taliban soldiers in their trademark Toyota trucks, firing their Kalashnikovs in the air, shouting, death to the American spy, and Zindabad, Osama, Osama Zindabad, which was, I was told later, long life to Mr. Bin Laden. We then got to the intelligence headquarters in Jalalabad, which I was to learn a year or so later was the winter home of the ex-King Shah um, of uh, Afghanistan. So I was taken into the intelligence headquarters and met by the director who spoke a smattering of English. And he said to, um, to me, will you write down your details because I was trying to tell him I'm a journalist, I'm working, um, I'm not a spy, I'm British. And he gave me a pen and paper and I wrote down as many names and contact details, people who could verify that I was indeed a journalist. After about half an hour, I gave him the details back. And he said, we are about to eat, you may join us. And I said, well, I just need to use the telephone first. And he said, impossible. I said, well, until I can use the telephone, I'm not eating as a guest or a prisoner of the Taliban. And he looked like that, and I was taken away into a room. Now, you would think that the Taliban couldn't care less that I'd gone on hunger strike. And yet every morning, noon and night, they would come into my room, they would lay out a cloth, they would bring in the most delicious smelling fresh bread, a lovely flat fresh bread, a bowl of rice, and in the afternoon and evening, there would be a, a little bit of stew with it. And if I was lucky, there might be three or four cubes of meat in there somewhere. And, uh, they would lay that there and they would bring in a jug of water and a bowl and they would wash my hands and they told me, you are our sister, you are our guest. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, you know, what don't these people understand about being an evil, brutal regime? You know, has nobody given them the job description? <laughs> <laughs> And each time I would say, can I use the telephone? They would say no and I'd say, take it away. On the third day, a doctor came. I hadn't called a doctor. I was feeling okay. And uh, he came with his stethoscope and his temperature um, thermometer. And he looked in my eyes, my ears, my mouth. He took my pulse. And then he started to take my <coughs> blood pressure. And I thought, they do this on death row, don't they? When they want to kill somebody, they like to make sure they're fit and healthy before they flick the switch or whatever these people are going to do. And something was bothering him about my blood pressure and he took it again and I said, yes, I know I have high blood pressure. He trained in Germany and he knew a little bit of English and he said, no, your blood pressure is normal. I said, don't be so ridiculous, how can it be normal? I've been captured by the Taliban. He said, look, and he took it again and it was normal. I said, there you go, three days with the Taliban and you've cured my blood pressure. Thank you very much. On the fifth day, Hamid, the translator, came running in very excited, waving the local newspaper from Jalalabad. And there on the front page were two pictures of me, although photographs were banned under the regime. There were two pictures there from the Reuters news agency and headlines which went right across the page and right down the paper, and there was a tiny little story. And I said to Hamid, what do the headlines say? And he said, the headlines say, the Taliban have cured Yvonne Ridley's blood pressure and she's very happy. <laughs> Not the catchiest of headlines, but it showed that the Taliban were maybe beginning to wake up to uh, be more media friendly than previously. Now, Hamid, the reason he was picked as my translator is 
He had the misfortune to speak English, Urdu and Pashto. And his father turned out to be the, um, the local doctor as well. And so he was brought in to act as a translator. And every day, these scary looking men, sometimes they would vary in numbers between five and eight, but these scary looking men would come in, some would come from Kandahar, some would come from Kabul, and they would start to ask questions. They wouldn't look at me. They would look at the ceiling, at the floor. They would look anywhere else but at me. I took that to be a total sign of their guilt, of their evil intent to kill me. <laughs> of course, I now know that they were just showing me respect. So we can see there's a total clash of cultures going on here. And um, because I decided that this was, uh, that, that I, I was going to be killed. I mean, every morning I would wake up, is this my last day on earth? Every night when I went to sleep, I would think, is this my last night on earth? I really thought that they would kill me. And on the grounds that you don't um, kiss the hand that slaps you, I just thought, it doesn't matter how nice or horrible I'm going to be, they're going to kill me. So I'm going to make their lives total misery and I'm going to go out fighting. I'm going to be the prisoner from hell. And so during the various interrogations, and I use the word lightly, they never threatened me physically. During the interrogations, I was rude, I was obnoxious, I would refuse to answer questions, I would make fun of them, uh, laugh at them, and, um, and Hamid had to translate this back to them. And he said to me at, uh, at the break of one session, he said, these people terrify me and they should terrify you. And I have to translate your angry words and one day they will punish me and not you. So he hated being in this position where he had to translate my words. On the sixth day, Hamid came to see me. And his face was almost black with fear. His mouth was so dry he could hardly talk. And he said, you have an important guest. You have an important visitor. You must be respectful. And I said, well, who is it? He said, please don't ask. I can't tell you. But he is very, very important. And you must show him respect. And I'm thinking, is it Mullah Omar? Maybe it's OBL. You know, who is it? <laughs> he went away, and a few minutes later, there was a knock at the door. Although I was the prisoner, I had my own key, and so I unlocked the door, and I opened it. And there, in front of me, was a man who made my blood run cold. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had avoided talking about religion for six days and there I was confronted face to face with a Taliban cleric. Well, I'm saying Taliban cleric. He didn't dress like the Taliban. Everything that they wore was above the ankle and uh, usually ripped or torn or, or dusty. This man had on an immaculate ivory gown which went right to the bottom, it covered his feet. He had an ivory turban, a very modest beard by Taliban standards, light brown, light brown eyes. He had beads which he moved two at a time and he had a very serene smile on his face. But there was something else about him and I couldn't work out what it was at the time, and it really freaked me out. It really spooked me. And when I got back to London and I told my first um, Muslim group, one of them went, Alhamdulillah, because I said, this guy really freaked me out because he had a shine on his face. But it wasn't shining on him. It was coming out of him. And the light was coming out of him to such a degree it was really spooky. Of course, I now know that to be the Noor. And I've seen Noor on people's faces since, but never to this intensity or degree. Anyway, it 
really unnerved me because I didn't know what it was. I stepped aside and um, invited him in. He was so elegant, he didn't walk, he just glided and uh, sat down and I went and sat opposite him. Hamid acted as the translator and he started. He said, what religion are you? And I thought, oh, here we go. I said, I'm a Christian. And he said, yes, but what sort of Christian are you? A Protestant, a Roman Catholic? And I said, I'm a, a Protestant from the Church of England. And he said, and what do you think of Islam? Now, in truth, I knew very little about Islam. And as it transpired, what I did know wasn't true anyway. So he said to me, what do you know about Islam? And I, what do you think of Islam? And I said, oh, it's amazing. It's absolutely wonderful. It's fantastic. And I then went off in praise of a faith that I knew nothing about. And he said, Islam is a beautiful religion. And I looked at him and I said, I couldn't agree more. And again, I went off in praise of this faith that I knew nothing about and proved it right at the end by saying, do you know what? The people around here are so passionate about their faith, they pray five times a day. I know because I've counted it. <laughs> of course, I didn't realize that the five prayers were obligatory. And he smiled. I mean, he must have thought, stupid woman, but he was far too <laughs> polite to say that. And he smiled and he moved his beads and he said, so you would like to convert? And I thought, oh, he's trapped me. If I say, yes, I'll convert to Islam, he'll say, you insincere, fickle woman, take her away and have her stoned. If I say, no, I'm not interested in uh, converting, he'll say, how dare you insult Islam? Take her away and have her stoned. You can see this stoning thing was really <laughs> going on in my mind. Having fallen for all the tabloid hype, and so I sat there for what seemed like an age, and then I said, I can't make such a life-changing decision, not while I'm in prison, but if you let me go, I promise when I get back to London, I will read the Quran and I will study Islam. He smiled, didn't say another word, didn't comment. He just got up and glided out. Hamid went running after him and returned a few minutes later, and he said, you're going, you're going home on a red crescent plane. Well, I punched the air and congratulated myself for having dealt with this Milana in such a clever way. And very soon I was on this truck bound for Kabul. Seven hours later, I was to find out something else about the Afghan nature. And that is, they don't like to deliver bad news. They like to keep you in a happy state. They like to keep you smiling and upbeat. And when I got up to Kabul, we drove straight past the airport, straight into the city and into, through the gates of the most grim third world prison of your imagination. And I'm slightly mystified at this, thinking what's going on here. And then I was uh, ordered out and, and taken down these dark, dingy corridors. And then this little metal door with a little spy hole was pushed open. And I looked inside and it was almost dark inside and there was a concrete floor. And I looked at these two men and I said, what are you showing me this for? And they said, you have to go in. I said, you've got to be joking. I'm going home on a red crescent plane. And they're looking at me and they said, no, you're not. You are a bad woman. You came to our country with no passport. You have to be punished. And I, the horror of going inside this cell, I turned around and said, you can't do this to me. I'm English. And they looked at me and somebody smiling and it was that sort of look as well of disbelief, you know, um, <laughs> that you have to go in. And I started screaming and shouting and then suddenly another 
metal door with a little spy hole opened and six women wearing hijabs or headscarves came out and one of them said to me, are you from the Red Cross? I said, you speak English. She said, well, I'm Australian. These two are American. The other three are German. I went, oh, my goodness, you're the charity workers who were um, arrested for trying to convert Muslims to Christianity. I told them my story and said, um, you know, I, I do, don't want to go into that cell. And they said, spend the night in our cell. It will get sorted out in the morning. And, uh, and I just thought, well, I hadn't had any female company for more than six days. They spoke my language. And furthermore, if I ever got out of this hellhole, I would have an even better story. So I said, OK. And uh, the, the two uh, guards were, I think, most relieved that a solution had been found and they cleared off. I walked into the cell and I just looked at the bars on the window and the concrete floor and the rickety bunk beds and I just started to cry and the sobbing started and I said, well, the Taliban have finally broken me. I'm deeper into Afghanistan than ever before. I'm now in a hellhole and I'm just never going to get out. And as I cried like any nicotine addict in a moment of crisis i went for my cigarettes although cigarettes were banned under the taliban they got me 200 when they realized i smoked american brand as well and uh, so i went to pull out my cigarettes and i said does anybody mind if i smoke and they all said yes this is a no smoking cell and I'm looking, thinking, how do I find the only no-smoking cell in Asia? And what sort of Christians are these? They can see how upset I am. And one of them said, look, if you must smoke, you can go outside into the courtyard. And I said, thank you. And I'm about to walk away when one of them said, we're about to hold a meeting. I said, a meeting? And they said, yes, we have two meetings a day. And I'm looking round in this godforsaken cell and I'm thinking what have they got to talk about <laughs> and then I realized we've all seen the movie The Great Escape this is obviously the escape committee <laughs> and I'm looking round for the stove and, and the you know they must be digging a tunnel so I suddenly lost interest in my cigarettes and I said can I listen into this meeting and they said yes you're very welcome so I sat on the edge of this uh, bunk bed and they uh, sat in a circle on the floor and then they pulled out Bibles. And I'm thinking, I don't believe this. They have been charged under Sharia law of trying to convert Muslims to Christianity and they're reading very loudly from their Bibles. I thought, any minute now, the Taliban are going to come crashing in through the cell door and they'll start beating everybody up and it'll be collective responsibility and I'll get a good hiding as well as them. But of course, as I was to find, find out later, the Quran makes it quite clear that Muslims must protect people of the book, Jews and Christians, and that is exactly what the Taliban were allowing these people to do by allowing them to carry on with their faith. So I um, sat back after 20 minutes of this very loud Bible reading. They then pulled out sheets of paper and they started singing. Now I used to sing in the church choir and, and we used to sing quite somber, gloomy Victorian hymns. This was full on in your face, Southern Baptist style, hallelujah type singing with clapping and all of this. And at that point, I got up and walked out into the courtyard. Three cigarettes later, I thought to myself, my parents will imagine that I am being tortured. And indeed, I am. If I have to listen to this <laughs> twice a day. And just then the azan started and I thought I've got crazy Muslims on this side of the wall. They've locked me up with these Christian fundamentalists. You know, I felt as though I'm trapped in an Andy Warhol movie. After the singing, 
They then started praying. And again, it wasn't the sort of prayers that I was used to. This was um, screaming and shouting. And I, I could remember at one point hearing one of the American girls saying, Lord Jesus, show us the way out of here. And I felt like shouting back straight down the corridor and turn left. But there's a great big talib at the other end. <laughs> Although I make fun of the girls, I have to say we still keep in touch. They, um, their faith got them through their ordeal, which began a lot earlier than mine. It started in the August and didn't end until the November and uh, the next day, I got up and I was given a change of clothes, which I was eternally grateful for. I was really starting to uh, lift. So I set about washing my, uh, my old clothes. And I was taken to this, um, this uh, hand crank pump thing. You see them in the Western movies, somebody going like this, and then the water eventually comes out. And it was just like that. And I said to one of the German girls, I said, this is amazing as the water started coming out into this zinc bucket. I said, how do they heat it? And she said, they don't. You know, this is cold water. Uh, welcome to life in Afghanistan. And they gave me a pumice stone. And um, so I set about trying to clean my clothes and just thinking how much we take for granted in the West, how we just throw things in press a switch and walk off. Two hours later, I hung my clothes up to dry. The prison governor, a fierce looking man with a great big black beard and a huge black turban. It was so big, I thought if he tilts one way or another, he's going to fall over. He came running into the courtyard and he and I hadn't hit it off from the previous day. And he barked at me, and, and basically what he was trying to say was, take those down. And I said, this is my washing. He said, remove it. And I said, no, it's drying. And he's starting to shake with, uh, with rage. And he said, cover it. And I said, you stupid man, how on earth will it dry <laughs> if I cover it? And I thought he was going to self-emoliate on the spot. <laughs> and then he dramatically threw his head in one direction and his hand in the other. And he said, remove those and went like that. And I followed the line of his hand. And he was pointing to my underwear. Now, I don't want to go into details, but we're not talking small, lacy, salacious. The sisters will recognize this. We're talking big, comfortable Bridget Jones numbers. So, <laughs> so he said, remove these items. And uh, at, at that, uh, I said, no, this is my washing. This is to dry. And I said, if you don't like it, you remove it. And he looked, and I thought he was going to explode. <laughs> So he went off, and I thought, well, that's the end of him. He returned 15 minutes later with the foreign minister of Afghanistan, your version of Condoleezza Rice, came in to the female courtyard, and he said, you have to take those items down. And I said, it's my washing, it's drying, this is the female wing of the prison, this is the female courtyard, this is the female washing line. If you two clear off, nobody's going to see my clothes drying. He said, the trouble is the Taliban are sleeping above the female wing of the prison. If they look out of the window and they see those items, they'll have impure thoughts. And I'm looking at him, and I, I said, that there's a solution here. He said, I knew you were a reasonable woman. I said, tell your soldiers not to look out of the window. <laughs> he said, this is impossible. And the argument continued long after the clothes had dried. But it gives you an indication of their modesty, their demeanor. Um, and as the argument was going on, as I say, you know, the, the Afghanistan's version of Condoleezza Rice embroiled in a row like that. I just thought America doesn't have to bomb Afghanistan. It just needs to fly in a regiment 
of women soldiers waving their underwear and the Taliban will just go straight away. The next day, the next day the foreign minister returned and he had with him his deputy, um, a man I nicknamed the Smiling Assassin, but he was um, his assistant and he was no, his real name was Mr. Afghani. And he came in and Mr. Afghani said, we need to ask you a few questions. By this time, I'd been on hunger strike for nine days. I'd had two or three sessions of the Hallelujah um, Christians. I was feeling very fractious. We'd had this bizarre episode the day before over my washing. And I just refused to cooperate with them and I just said do what you want I'm not interested anymore and I shouted and abused them and insulted them and they stood there as I let rip and then I turned around and I did something that I've never done before and, and uh, hopefully will never do again after I finished this torrid of abuse I then spat at the foreign minister and I walked off. I went into my cell and the Christian said, I can't believe that you just did that. And I said, I know I've crossed a line now and I'm sure I'm going to be punished. Just then one of the female prison officers came in and she spoke in Pashto to the American girls who understood the language. And she said, tell the English woman she's going to be flogged for behaving so badly to a high ranking officer. So I stood there shaking, wondering where this flogging would take place. Would it be a public flogging? Would Al Jazeera be filming it? What was going to happen to me? Um, all of these thoughts were going through my mind. And about 15 minutes later, we heard the prison gates go. And Mr. Afghani came in, very, very theatrical. He opened the cell door. And he came in and he had in his hand the one thing that I wanted, the one thing that I had gone on hunger strike for, he had in his hand a satellite telephone. And he waved it round, very dramatically, theatrical fashion. And he said, all of you, all of you to the Christian girls, you can all ring home. You can all ring your mothers, your fathers, your family, your loved ones, everybody, everybody can ring home. Apart from her, the English woman, she's horrible and she spat at us and she must be punished. And that is how the Taliban chose to punish me, which uh, I was greatly relieved at, but I also thought showed great wisdom on their side because I had to sit and watch those girls ring home. And of course, I was really happy for them because they, um, the Germans in particular hadn't spoken to their family since before they were arrested. So you can imagine the joy and, and uh, tears and, and emotions running around that cell as each one made a call to mothers, fathers, brothers, friends. Two hours of really high emotion and one of the German girls went up to Mr. Afghani and she said please let Yvonne ring home it was her daughter's birthday just a couple of days ago and she'd be so happy and he said we can't the woman is horrible she has to be punished and as I say that is how they chose to punish me a couple of hours later the smiling assassin returned with a couple of guards and he said to me, collect your things, you're going. I didn't have time to say goodbye to any of the Christians and I was rushed straight out and taken behind the prison and up some stairs and taken into the um, Taliban sleeping quarters. And I was taken to a room at the end which had belonged to a, a senior officer and he'd vacated it for me. And I thought, I wonder what's going on here. Maybe I'm still going to be flogged. Maybe I'm going to be executed. You know, something funny is going on. 
I was then told, tomorrow you are going home, inshallah. I said, what is this inshallah you put on the end of every sentence because it never happens. <laughs> of course, I now know. And off they went and I'm sitting there contemplating my fate. Can I trust these people? No, because they're the most evil, brutal regime in the world. Am I going home? Probably not. What is going to happen to me? They're probably going to execute you. Something awful is going to happen. And all of these thoughts were going through my mind. I went to get my cigarettes and I had that dreadful dilemma that I, I don't smoke anymore, but I had this dreadful dilemma that faces smokers. I had one match. And uh, so one cigarette after another, I chain smoked. So there I was sitting in this, uh, in this room on my own and this huge noise outside. And all I can describe, if you could imagine the sound of somebody just ripping the sky open, and that's what it sounded like. And the whole light, um, everything, it was just um, silver. And the, um, the war had started. That night, America and Britain dropped 20, 30 cruise missiles on Kabul alone. And you can hear these from about 20 miles away. These were coming within a quarter of a mile of the prison. And although I'd covered conflicts and wars before and, and um, comforted widows and, and, uh, and wives and mothers from anything from the Falklands War onwards, it had never occurred to me until that moment that bombs don't discriminate. There is no such thing as a strategic hit. And it suddenly occurred to me, I'm probably going to be blown up by my own country tonight. Bombs uh, can't tell nationalities, can't tell Afghans, <coughs> Americans, Germans, English, man, woman, child, military, civilian. It was terrifying. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. And I vowed if I ever got out alive that I would tell as many people how terrifying and futile this sort of uh, bombing and this sort of war is. And that was just one night of it. When the place suddenly fell silent, there was, it was followed by a really eerie silence. And I was listening intently because I was sure that um, people in Kabul would be so angry that they might march on the prison and want to kill all the Westerners that were being held there. And I just thought, well, whatever happens, there is no way that the Taliban are going to let me go now. But the next morning, a people carrier came, and I was put in it, driven off about seven hours down to uh, Torkham, back to those familiar gates. And we sat in this people carrier for about 15, 20 minutes. It seemed like a long time. And I thought, it's a trick. They're just lifting my hopes to dash them down again. And it's just a trick. And they're probably still going to execute me. So not one time during that whole 10-day period did I look at them in any really favorable light. The gates finally opened and the people carrier lurched forward and then the Taliban officer in the front seat turned around to me and he said, you're free, you're free to go. And I'm looking at him and I still didn't trust them. And I remember stepping backwards out of the people carrier just so I could watch them and then I started to walk across towards the media who were waiting on the other side of no man's land. And with each step I took, I began to realize, you know what? Those guys had been very honorable. They had been very respectful and they had treated me well. I really wanted to turn around and go back and say, look, I am so sorry for being the prisoner from hell. 
but I just felt if I turned round, they would probably shoot me because I don't know who was happier to see the back of me, them or me. Really, they were so relieved that I was going as well. As I reached the media, the journalists shouted, how did the Taliban treat you? And I said, they treated me with respect and courtesy. This is not what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear about the abuse. They wanted to hear about the torture, the burn marks, the beatings, the interrogations. Where, did I have all my nails? You know, what, why hasn't she got any black eyes or any scars or you know, what's going on here? In fact, everything that we consequently saw coming out of Abu Ghraib, out of Bagram, at Guantanamo Bay, I really thought would have happened to me, which often prompts me to say, thank God I was captured by the most evil, brutal regime in the world and not by the Americans. <laughs> when I got home, I thought about what had happened and I remembered the cleric who'd visited me and I thought well against all the odds while they held on to other westerners they let me go so I'll keep my word and I'll start reading the Quran and in truth I thought as a journalist covering the Middle East and Asia it was shocking that I knew so little about a religion which was clearly a way of life for people so how on earth could I write with any authority on the region if I didn't understand the people, their cultures, and their faiths. And so I set about reading the Quran. I was given an English translation by A. Yusuf Ali, and it had an index in the back. So I thought, I'm going to make this easy. I'm going to cherry pick, first of all, all the subjects on women. And so I set about looking for the chapter, how to beat up your wife, how to subjugate your daughters and I couldn't find anything like that but what I did find <coughs> was that the Holy Quran makes it perfectly clear, crystal clear that women are equal in spirituality and worth and education and as I started reading more and more into the Quran I was looking at a, an amazing blueprint for life, not just for men, but for women as well. And it was, I was blown away by what I was reading. I then started reading books about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I'd never heard of him six years ago, didn't know he existed. Now I would give my last drop of blood to defend his honor, to defend his name, you know, what a wonderful, perfect, amazing man. And look how he united us last year over those vile cartoons. So I, the first biography I read, I thought, well, that's from the Muslim perspective. I read two or three more written by non-Muslims. And I couldn't believe the, um, how wonderful this man was. I then started reading more supporting literature and discovered that the first convert to Islam was an international businesswoman, a trader, a very astute businesswoman, Khadija. The first convert to Islam, the first martyr to Islam was a woman. When the Quran was finally compiled in the first book form, it was entrusted into the hands of a woman. The Prophet, peace be upon him, spoke about how a woman had protected him on the battlefield and he said everywhere I went she was there protecting me and I'm thinking women were fighting alongside the men. There were great women scholars. 60% of the Hadith are down to a woman scholar. I was just blown away by the importance and the significance of women. I then was amazed to find out about the wedding contracts. The newspapers get so excited, don't they, about these prenuptial wedding agreements and the teams of Hollywood lawyers who draw them all up. They probably got their inspiration from the Quran. 
And uh, I, I was, as I say, just totally blown away by the, the rights bestowed on women 1,400 years ago that have only recently come into the gift of Western women. Um, I, it, it really blew me. I then went out into the Muslim community and far from finding shy, retiring, subjugated, oppressed creatures, I found some amazing women. Six years ago, I would have looked at this side of the room and I would have thought, how on earth did they escape from the kitchen sink to get here? <laughs> now I'm looking and I'm seeing amazing women who are doing degrees, masters, PhDs, doctors, lawyers, uh, politicians of the future, homemakers. I love the way Islam restores the dignity back to being a mother and to being a homemaker. Um, I see community leaders. I see multi-skilled, multi-talented. Well, you don't need me to go on. You know how lucky you lot are. So um, really, I was everything just... Uh, totally turned up my, my thinking upside down. On June the 30th, 2003, just after 11 o'clock in the morning, I took my shahada and I joined what I think is the biggest and the best family in the world. I became a Muslim. My timing could have been better, let's face it. These are troubled times for Muslims across the world. Our family is in great pain. There are rivers of Muslim blood flowing through Chechnya, Kashmir, Afghanistan, pa uh, Pakistan, um, in Iraq. We saw what happened in Lebanon last year. It is a tragedy what is happening and the ongoing unfolding tragedy of Palestine. And I have to stand here tonight and salute the heroic resistance of the Palestinian people because if it weren't for them, we would have lost Jerusalem a long, long time ago. We have an amazing family and we can be incredibly strong. We showed it last year over the horrible business of the cartoons, when so-called moderates, and I, I hate that word, but when so-called moderates join together with so-called extremists and everybody in between, we all came together in condemnation of what happened. Um, the reason I hate the word moderate <coughs> is when we're told we should be moderate, it's as though we should dilute our Islam as though there's something wrong with it. We have been given a perfect faith. It doesn't need to be diluted. And I'm sure that, um, that you wouldn't want your children to be moderate scholars at school. I'm sure you don't want them to have moderate results in their exams. I'm sure you want them to do extremely well and get extremely high marks. So I hate the word, um, the word moderate. To me, being a Muslim, we are easily defined. We believe in the five pillars of Islam. And you're either a Muslim or you're not. It's like being pregnant. Who ever heard of anybody being moderately pregnant? <laughs> so finally, what I'll do is I'll, I'll finish now with... Um, with a, a, one more little story just to share my Malcolm X moment with you and then we can throw open to some questions. I was lucky enough to perform Hajj a couple of years ago and I went, uh, went, I went to, to Mecca, Medina, everything that um, Hajjis do and when I got back, a few people said, what was the most spiritually moving moment for you? Was it seeing the Kaaba for the first time? Was it uh, going to Mount Arafat? What was it? And I said, actually, 
it was one day when um, when I was running late for prayer. I'd been idling my time and, and fell behind. And I heard the call to prayer. And I grabbed my prayer mat, left my room. The lift wasn't working. And I ran down the stairs from this little hotel, which was on the top of a hill in Mecca. I ran down this bank and cut through some side streets, leaping downstairs two, three at a time, got out to this uh, street corner and was ready to hurtle round the corner to make the final dash into the masjid to get there before the prayers started. And as I turned round the corner to make that final sprint, there in front of me were tens of thousands of other hajis who were all late for prayer. We were pushing and shoving and uh, there was all ages, all nationalities, all cultures, different languages. The brother to my right was speaking in a language I haven't a clue what it was. I recognized the sister to my left as speaking um, a little bit of Urdu. I recognized something of what she was saying. But basically it was total chaos. We were all late. And then suddenly the first prayer began. And within two, three seconds, we had snapped into lines, regimental lines, that any sergeant major would have been proud of. Those of us who had prayer mats put them down on the pavement or the road. And we started praying. And we all started praying in the same tongue. We could all understand each other, praying in the same tongue, in the same direction, to the same God. And out of that chaos came a unity not a single army in the world could have performed, not within two or three seconds. It was absolutely amazing. The brother to my right, I could understand him. The sister to my left could understand me. We were all one. And it was amazing. And it was a fantastic feeling of unity. And I just thought, if we could capture this unity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, instead of just five times a day, if we could capture this unity across the globe, <coughs> imagine how strong we would be. Allah's army, and we wouldn't need to pick up a single weapon. People wouldn't dare invade our lands. They wouldn't dare torture our brothers. They wouldn't dare abuse our sisters. They would stand back and respect us for who and what we are. And I just wish that we could capture this unity and, uh, and see that it spreads right through the Ummah. Because, as I said, we're all very different in many ways, but we are easily identified as Muslims. We believe in the five pillars of Islam and we need to focus on what unites us, not what divides us. Anyway, I wanted to share that um, moment with you. I hope you've enjoyed listening to my story as much as I've enjoyed telling it, you've been fantastic and you really helped me tell the story and your reactions have been great. Thank you very much. Well, um, my daughter is very supportive of me. Um, I'm still hoping to bring her into the dean. Um, and she is embracing various aspects of Islam. So, you know, inshallah, she'll get there. My elder sister has had no contacts with Muslims at all and thinks I'm going to go off to Tel Aviv to blow myself up. <laughs> my other sister has... Muslim neighbors and thankfully they've been great Muslim neighbors over the last 20 years so when I 
told her, she said, oh, my neighbours are Muslims and they're really nice. So I was eternally grateful that they weren't the neighbours from hell. My mother is in her 80s. Her reaction when, well, I'm saying when I told her, I emailed her. Her reaction was to start going to church again. And I said, well, that's great. It shows that Islam is already having a positive effect um, on our lives and that you're getting some spirituality back into yours. And, you know, my mother, her ways are very Islamic in, in, in so many details. And as I said before, she's in her 80s. And I said to her, you know, mum, Christianity is a great springboard to Islam. And you've just got a little step to make because... You're so Islamic in everything that you do. And she said, oh, I don't want to get involved in some newfangled Arab religion. And I said, where do you think Jesus comes from? Manchester? <laughs> and for the first time in her life, she realized that the roots to Christianity are in the same soil as <coughs> Judaism and Islam. And she's thinking more and more um, so, you know, please make dua for me that um, she'll make that, um, that move. Inshallah. Yes? My daughter's 15. Have you ever been back to Afghanistan and contacted any of the Taliban? I've been back to Afghanistan many times. I absolutely love the country. <laughs> Um, there's one particular spot that uh, I keep thinking if I retire, I would just love to go and live there. And that is on the outskirts of Jalalabad where the two rivers meet and it's just so beautiful there. The land is beautiful, the people are beautiful and it just breaks my heart to see the way that uh, the country has, uh, has gone now. Um, the, the war, in my view, has been lost already by America and Britain. They're finished. And it doesn't matter how many soldiers that they throw at Afghanistan, they can never win. And the reason why I say that um, is that uh, that land has never, ever been conquered. Alexander the Great got a good hiding when he went in there. The Mongol hordes didn't last that long. The British army has been in there three times already. Um, one of the campaigns was so devastating that all 5,000 uh, soldiers were um, annihilated with the exception of one medical doctor, a, an army major, who was allowed to go back through um, the Khyber Pass to tell the tale um, that really we shouldn't go back in there again. Well, it was 30,000, was it? Well, you know, um, there's certainly quite a, a history there. And what is interesting, by the, the people who held me, they said to me, we don't like occupying armies and that goes for the Arabs as well and I said what do you mean by the Arabs and they said there's 3,000 here who are occupying our land we invited them as our guests and they're now abusing <coughs> that and uh, they think that they're our masters and I was surprised at that and they were referring to Al-Qaeda so certainly the ones that held me had no great love for the Arabs who were there. However, um, through necessity, I would guess, um, and through my enemy's enemy, etc., they've uh, they've uh, united. But um, at, at that point, it was quite um, quite interesting uh, that they said that. Um, I understand there's quite a few Afghans in here tonight, and so, you know, please do feel free to correct me if I'm assessing the situation wrongly, but um, 
that that is my assessment that the country cannot be conquered um, by military means and what America and Britain need to do is to restart the Hearts and Minds campaign and leave their guns behind and uh, genuinely help the country to, uh, to get back on its feet. And um, I don't feel as though th that a genuine attempt has been made. No, well, this is the, the trouble. I mean, if, if they would only look into the history books, they would, um, they would realize the hopelessness of this case. But of course, um, I, th I believe that American politicians are the same as British politicians. They can make very brave decisions when it involves sending other people's sons and daughters into battle and not their own. There's certainly, um, as far as I'm aware, no American or British politicians uh, whose children are at the moment in uniform serving um, in, in that area. Um, the last time I went into Afghanistan, I went in undercover again, not to hide from the Taliban. I wanted to, I don't like being embedded as a journalist. And I went down into uh, Gardez and then into Paktika to a, a little village called Burmil near Shkin, which is on the Pakistan border. And I was told that um, a war crime had been committed. And I was taken to the edge of this village, Burmil, and there was a house that had been reduced to rubble. And I was uh, told that uh, laser-guided missiles had been sent into the house in the belief that it was a Taliban stronghold. The villagers, who were obviously awoken by this midnight strike, went to the house to try and rescue the people trapped inside, and they were beaten, they told me that they were beaten back by American soldiers who insisted that it was a Taliban stronghold. And by daybreak, the cries and screams had gone, and they pulled out 11 bodies um, from a baby in arms through to a 13, 14-year-old girl, 11 children. Nine of those children represented the, uh, an entire family for one woman, and I spoke to her and uh, talk about the living dead. This woman had lost all her nine children. And um, the American commander had heard that there was a Western journalist around the area, and he returned with uh, 50 armed guards, and he went to the two fathers of the 11 dead children, said, sorry, we made a mistake. Here's half a million Afghanis. Now, that might sound like quite a lot of money to some, but uh, the Afghans here will realize it works out at less than $1,000 per child. And that is what an Afghan life is worth. When you compare that to the $10 million, pounds, sorry, $10 million received by each family who lost somebody in the Lockerbie air disaster. But of course, as I said before, Muslim blood is a cheap commodity and... Um, and that was the harsh reality. And that wasn't just a one-off incident. It's happening all the time. Now, a friend of mine, Ella Rostopovi, who's written a book about Afghan women, she um, also went into areas where uh, Western journalists wouldn't normally go. And like me, she came across a lot of people who were beginning to wish that the Taliban might come back because at least they had security. And as one woman said, I hated the Taliban because they murdered two of my uncles and I hate them. But the Americans have killed 16 of my cousins, work out the maths. And that is the, the, the sad um, reality is, as I see it, and um, as other people see it.
sorry? What um, changed my mind um, was by doing something that a lot of critics of Islam fail to do, and that's sit down and, and uh, bother to find out about the faith. And I said before I was a, a Christian, um, I probably went to church about twice a month, which in secular Britain is bordering on fanaticism. But the, the main thrust of the Christian religion is love thy neighbor, and, um, and, and that is, you know, one of the main thrusts about this peace and love. What impressed me about Islam is the strong theme of justice which runs right through it. Now, anybody can love their neighbor, but it takes a special faith to deliver justice in equal measure to your neighbor as well as to a stranger, even to your enemy. And, um, and that the, the equality and the fairness and the justice in Islam and the very simple but just code of life that it offered um, really impressed me about, um, about that faith. I uh, live in central London. I wish I could live in Afghanistan. And I'm not just saying that. I love um, the dramatic landscape, the, uh, the people, and the food. I love the food. I can't believe I, you know, I missed out for 10 days. And the first time I went back, I was taken to the um, Shamali Plains. And somebody gave me a banana, and it was a little bruised, awful-looking thing. And I know how precious food is in that region, so I accepted it with gratitude and uh, ate it in front of my guest. And, and with the first bite, I looked at it, and she said, is it all right? And I said, it tastes like banana. And she said, it is a banana. I said, yes, but... We have these great big um, bright yellow bananas in supermarkets and you bite them and they don't taste of anything. And this was tasted like a banana. And I sudden, and the fruit, the sultanas, the, the raisins, everything tasted so good that, um, that I realized, you know, I don't know what we do to our food in the West, but... Um, the, the food in Afghanistan, really, I was once told it's heaven sent, and really, it, uh, it, it is delicious.